we are watching I the CMA section by section the, um, the as text is going through I realize no um, it is so decided. <laughs> For those of us who do follow these things, uh, do excuse me, but some of this is quite dry to the rest of us, the layman like me. I'm, I'm struggling to uh, follow every section and subsection and all the numbers and letters that follow them. But, uh, Richard Black is with me and Catherine Abreu, the Executive Director of Destination Zero. Um, we'll keep listening because there will be a finale to this and we should tune into that. But Catherine, I want to get your thoughts. You were, you were very animated the other day on, on the stage when the third draft of the text came out. And right at the death tonight, we've had another change in that critical section about coal, an intervention from India, phase down instead of phase out coal. What do you make of it? Yeah, that's right. So I think it's really interesting that the final hours of COP26 have come down to this like show off over language related to phasing out unabated coal power and inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, which really goes to show you how much that language, as weak as it already was, is quite precedent setting in this space. So we've now had a shift because of India's reservations with the existing text from phase out to phase down. A lot of countries expressing their disappointment with that change, getting on record that they would prefer for it to be stronger. But in all honesty, I'm, you know, while it is true that we should have been phasing out coal-fired electricity a decade ago, uh, I don't know that this change really makes a huge difference. In the end, what we've got here is a wedge in the door of accelerating the energy transition in this space. And so what we're going to have to do over the coming years is really pull that door more open. That's really interesting. So you, you are actually half class full. The fact that that section is in there, that's groundbreaking in and of itself for you. It is for this space, like I said. So, you know, we had this conversation a couple of days ago, right, that for over 30 years we've been entering into these negotiations year after year. There have been previous attempts to include language around phasing out fossil fuels in this space that have been totally squashed. And finally, we get a little bit of that text surviving. I think the important thing to reflect on is that the energy transition is ongoing out there in the real world, as are the movements of people across different sectors who are trying to accelerate that energy transition. And whatever gets said here or doesn't get said here doesn't stop all of that. It's just important that we make sure this process somehow reflects it. And again, we've taken a little step in that direction today. It will be amazing, Richard, to many people out there who are watching, given what we're talking about, and that is fossil fuels, yes. that it's never appeared before in the text. I, I think Catherine actually said, you said to me the other day, it's a bit like talking about the COVID pandemic without actually mentioning the virus. Completely it's right. It's absolutely it, central to yeah. what we're talking about, and it's the first time it's appeared in the text. I know, it's bizarre, isn't it, when you look at that point of view. I mean, the reality is, of course, that a lot of governments haven't wanted it to appear. I mean, you think about Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, you think about some of the other Gulf states, you think about Australia, where the government still seems to believe it can plot an e economic future on coal exports, and they simply haven't wanted it included. There is a dichotomy, actually, in the way that these governments treat that part of the science that deals with climate impacts and the way the world is warming and how they treat that bit of the science that tells you how to get out of the problem because we see in the text here are lots of references to the science impacts of two celsius impacts of 1.5 lead for you know urgent mitigation well then you look at the mitigation bit the the, the, bit, the bit for example of the Inter intergovernmental panel on climate change that deals with how to get out the problem, how to reduce emissions, coal phase out is all over it. As, by the way, is oil and gas phase out. And that's probably the, the next battle line over fossil fuels here, which I guess may well be starting next year. And just a word about Alex Sharma, because he did pause. It was an emotional moment and uh, he had to just stop. And we should mention that because it, 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 all of this rests on his shoulders as the COP presidency. I said earlier in the day, actually, he's not here as Boris Johnson's servant. He is a servant to all 196 parties that are here. Uh, and he has to find a, a landing zone for all of them. But it did strike me, I was watching, as they were going around the room, we were talking in the, before the plenary, the formal plenary started, he went up to the Indian delegation and he actually showed him the text and he pointed to a word and it must have been the moment that they had to change the word. Yeah. 
and then all hell broke loose because John Kerry wanted to get involved then and then the Chinese delegation and you heard the anger actually from the European delegation in the room and it, it really did go down to the wire. Yeah, this kind of diplomatic stuff does often happen at the conclusion of, of one of these COPs. We've seen other, other COPs before where you know there's a small huddle of a key country and someone comes up with the key piece of language that allows everyone to, to get out the room. I think the other thing that this says about Alok Sharma is that he's he's gained the trust of these delegations over over the past year and this is a really important thing to do because you know he, if, 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 there's, if there's a personal relationship there if the negotiator trusts trusts him a bit and he trusts the negotiator and you know the, the, then that 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 means an awful lot in terms of getting the deal over the line what role has he played Catherine in the uh, you were telling me um, about you know, the UN representatives and the role that they've played in this out of sight. What role has he played specifically as, as the key Sherpa? So it is the role of the president to take control in this moment where we're trying to get through those decision texts and really guide the parties into a consensus-based outcome. But I think we've seen in the past that there are some presidents who really drive that outcome to as much ambition as they possibly and we were talking earlier about those moments when we've seen a cops of presidents just gaveling through despite seeing hands of opposition being raised in the uh, amongst the parties. Um, and we've seen other presidents who've taken a less uh, confrontational route, who've maybe sought consensus on a lower common denominator basis. I think here, you know, we've really seen that Alok Sharma was committed to getting some of this important language uh, committed to by the parties to figuring out how to make deals and how to make sure that everyone was on board with some of those language, some of those pieces that, that you know, people had concerns over the language around. What was, just before we came away from um, the room there, um, w one of the things that was quite interesting, and, and, I, and I, I was asking a guest earlier where the Climate Roadshow goes next, and obviously there's disappointment about a dialogue surrounding loss and damage, and the fact that financial instruments for adaptation aren't there, but already you've got countries volunteering, saying, hey, we'll host, we'll host a, a workshop to, to get this on the road. And so it, it, it does move quite quickly. Yes, it really does. And by the way, there's one other thing being here in Glasgow that we should flag up at this point. This process for agreeing the global goal on adaptation, Glasgow now has its name on it. So we've had the Paris Agreement, we've had the Copenhagen Accords earlier on, we had the Bali Roadmap. We now have the Glasgow Sharm El Sheikh Work Programme on the global goal on adaptation. Right. So, so whenever the, adaptation is mentioned, basically. Glasgow will have its yeah, name on it. Yes, exactly. This is quite an interesting thing I think that's going to happen. So. In the Paris Agreement from six years ago, we will uh, develop a global goal on adaptation. Has it really been uh, clear what that means? And you know, for six years it's been in abeyance, but now within two years we're going to have this. I think we can, we, can, we can get some of the idea of the importance of it by looking at things like the Millennium Development Goals and then the Sustainable Development Goals, where there's a lot of technical work that goes on, which is useful to everyone. And it also mobilizes donors. It kind of focuses their attention on, okay, this is the goal, therefore this is where we're going to need to spend some money. So hopefully in two years we might have one and then it won't be the draft uh, Glasgow thing, it'll be the real Glasgow thing. Alex Sharma said at the outset of this that, look, it's not, it's not the perfect document, uh, it's a big compromise, there will be disappointment. It depends where you stand on whether you see this as a success or a failure. But really, the argument's more nuanced than that, isn't it? it th there's a bit in it for everybody. Do you see in it uh, the roadmap to Sharm and, 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 the, and the, the, the signposts along the way to 2025, I guess, that, that tells you that this decisive decade, we are moving now in the right direction? So we did get a little bit of that, right? I mean, I think something to really acknowledge about the text that we have now is that it has clearly identified the end goal, which is holding warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And so we've seen, okay, we're here at COP26 united to drive toward that goal. Have we seen, though, a reflection of the scale up of effort that is required to deliver on that goal? We have a little bit of the rhythm of, of NDC enhancement, which is countries being called back to increase their climate pledges. There's now an expectation in there that countries will increase their climate pledges before the end of 2022. We have a little bit of an indication of when uh, countries are going to be expected to come back and communicate more measures, more policies toward achieving their goals. So I think that is positive. 
And let's also dwell for a moment on the fact that we've had more of a conversation on loss and damage in this space than we've really ever had before at a COP, and I think that's good news. Okay, uh, I'm nervous that we're going to miss the the finale, uh, the big event when the hammer comes down for the last time. So let's go back into the room and just listen to some of it. To adopt the draft decision as amended. Hearing no objections, it is so decided. I invite the COP to consider sub-item 8D, report of the Global Environment Facility to the Conference of the Parties and guidance to the Global uh, Environment Facility for 2020 and 2021. I now invite the COP to adopt the decision entitled Report of the Global Environment Facility to the Conference of the Parties and Guidance to the Global Environment Facility contained in document FCCC stroke CP stroke 2021 stroke L8. Hearing no objections, it is so decided. I invite the COP to consider sub item 8E seventh review of the financial mechanism. Parties were unable to complete their consideration of this matter, therefore consideration of this matter will continue at COP27. Hearing no objections, it is so decided. I invite the COP to consider sub-item 8F, compilation and synthesis of and summary report of the in-session workshop on biennial communications of information related to Article 9, Paragraph 5 of the Paris Agreement. I now invite the COP to adopt the decision entitled Compilation and Synthesis of and Summary Report on the In-Session Workshop on Biennial Communications of Information related to Article 9, Paragraph 5 of the Paris Agreement, contained in document FCCC stroke CP stroke 2021 stroke L7. Hearing no objections, it is so decided. I invite the COP to consider agenda item 12, report of the forum on the impact of the implementation of response measures. This item was considered by the Substa and the SBI. I thank the chairs, the Substa and the SBI and parties for their hard work and for forwarding a recommendation to the COP, following which I undertook further consultations. I now invite the COP to adopt the draft decision entitled Matters Relating to the Forum on the Impacts of the Implementation of Response Measures, contained in document FCCC stroke CP stroke 2021 stroke L4 to FCCC stroke KP stroke CMP stroke 2021 stroke L2. Hearing no objections, it is so decided. I invite delegates to consider sub Another section item of the document D going through. We're just going to break away from that and keep our eye on it as we do that because Tina Stege from uh, the Marshall Islands, who's been negotiating for the Marshall Islands over the last few days, has just joined me. And we've seen you in the plenary session over the last few hours. Um, first of all, let me talk to you about the very last minute change in the text relating to coal. Uh, you were pretty angry about it, I think. It phasing down rather than phasing out. What happened? There was a conversation uh, that we were not a part of, um, and it was a real blow. It was a real blow. We had been told that there would be no further changes to the texts, and uh, we had already swallowed some changes that were very difficult to swallow and that came at the end and um, as I said in my statement in the plenary uh, there are other pieces of that package that are critical that we fought really hard to get and that are part of the lifeline that people in my country need and so we took it but I needed to express uh, the deep disappointment that we that we felt about having to do that. India is a very big voice in the room, naturally, um, and and I guess Alok Sharma, as the president, took the view that he wouldn't get this across the line unless he bowed to what they were saying. Was it as was it as simple as they wouldn't have backed the whole document had he not made that change? As I said, we weren't in the room, and um, perhaps. If we had been, I could answer your question, but I, I can't tell you. Uh, but I think for us, 
particularly from the very small island states. Um, we come here to speak, to be heard, and to, for that to happen, we need to be in the room. Um, so this is where we are. We do have a package that has a doubling of adaptation finance, which is something that the High Ambition Coalition really brought up, brought to the table. And there's also other pieces of the package that reflect the leader statement that we put out last week. So really, really important pieces that, you know, we could not afford to lose and that we hope gives us a basis for more progress. It has to. This has to be the basis for more progress, much more accelerated progress over the next year up to COP27. Um, John Kerry said, you have to trust us. He said, we, we, it's in there, the text, it's in there now, loss and damage. Um, they are serious about engaging with it. Is there enough trust in the room that the big powers will now engage in a serious conversation about loss and damage? Well, he's on the record. He said it. He sure he's, is. He, he sure is. is. He's he on the record. The he said yeah. it in the room. He said that they will engage, and that's what our expectation is. And we just need to hold him accountable to his for his words. You've thrown so much into it, particularly this last few days. I don't know if people know, but some of your delegation had to go home for quarantining purposes. You chaired the High Ambition Coalition with John Kerry and Franz Timmerman in there and did a really good job on that by all accounts. But so how do you how do you leave here? How do you leave Glasgow? Are you are you happy? Are you angry? How, how, what's your emotion tonight? I mean, I'm exhausted. <laughs> uh, but we not only fought a good fight, but we're going to live to fight another day. And we did so much that as a very small island country, I can be deeply proud of. Um, and I can go home and say there's more financing for adaptation. Uh, I can go home and say it is a package that addresses mitigation and the 1.5 and folks coming back to the table to keep that in reach. And those are what we needed. So if everything that's adopted here, all the agreements on methane, on ending the internal combustion engine, on transport generally, on coal, if all of that is adopted and everybody's good to their word, they say, they say that we could be near 1.8. It's not 1.5. What would 1.8 mean to the Marshall Islands? We need 1.5. And we need more than saying and promises. We need actions. And we need those actions to be tied to better targets. And we need to make sure that 1.5 remains the North Star. 1.8 I'm not fathoming 1.8. 1.1, which is where we're now, is also deeply, is already deeply challenging. Before I came here, I was receiving pictures from a cousin of a king tide that literally was bubbling up through the ground of my brother's, right around my brother's house. And I was getting pictures and videos of this flood where the water literally came up through the ground. That's happening now at 1.1. So I don't want to talk about 1.8.